happy Sabbath, everybody, and good morning. Um, I'm going to share uh, a message. It's going to be shorter than usual, but um, I was watching this uh, video recently, and these two guys were talking about their mindset about the, the pandemic. And before all of this started, right, before when everything, when life was all good, right, and all this, this one guy says, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's really weird because have you ever felt the feeling that life is going well, but you had a hard time enjoying it? You never really expected all of this craziness to happen, but even when it was going well, it just, we kind of go through this life with that and just constantly just have this feeling, you know, it's like, you know, things are going, you kind of have this idea. It's like, yeah, things are okay now, but I'm so, it's like, it's at the back of your mind constantly, this worry about keeping things normal. And it's, uh, you just have, find little time to enjoy it because, you know, I know by this time next week, um, I could be in big trouble. Um, and then what this thing happens, right? This whole coronavirus, whatever, like one day, or maybe it's something else that you actually do find yourself in trouble one way or a situation or another. Right. And then somehow your mind switches to a different mode. Right. Um, somehow you tell yourself, okay, now my worrying, all that worrying that I had is, is justified because I actually have to deal with this trouble now, right? I don't know if you understand what I'm talking about, right? I'm watching this because this totally resonates with me, right? I, it's um, this what if game that we all play with ourselves. And I know the what if game very, very, very well. Even back when I was a kid, you know, as a student, it was hard to really enjoy all the A's that I would get because I was always worried about what if I failed the next test, right? Fast forward to today, right? And it's hard for me to enjoy the A's my kids are getting because I'm worried what if they fail the next test, right? And it's just this constant thing, right? And this is just, I understand it's just what if. Um, some of the things that go in Pastor Robin's head, you know, what if I suddenly get fired? What if the conference moves me to another church? What if uh, one day something happens to my wife? What if something happens to my kids? Uh, what if uh, people find out this truth about me that I don't want people to know about, right? What if everybody at church finds out or everybody in school finds out or social media finds out or whatever, you know? There's so many different what ifs that can go through someone's head. I think most of us understand the what if game. Question is, what's the what if for you? What's that look like? What do you worry about? The hardest thing, when you're trapped in the what if game, this, um, it's usually hard to find out that's actually happening to you at that time. You know what I'm talking about, right? You only find out like years, years later that um, through some sort of interruption usually in your life. And then you realize like, oh, oh my gosh, I just spent all these years playing what if and worrying about everything what, when life was actually good. And now that life is it's like, oh, it's over. And now I actually have to worry. Wanna go to a um, story in the Bible. Cause this is one town. It's in the book of Acts. This one town is full of what ifers, what ifers. And so the apostle Paul and Silas, they go to this town, right? And they end up freeing this woman who's possessed by an evil spirit, right? And she has this um, evil spirit that actually um, apparently has the ability to, uh, how can you say this, uh, prophecy, right? Uh, she was like a kind of fortune teller, kind of evil spirit possessed her. Anyways, this town, she wasn't the only one. This town actually had a business, businesses, making money, casting out spirits and fortune telling, all that spir spiritism stuff, right? Um, and so they all start thinking, oh, shoot, Paul and Silas, look, look at these two guys, where do they come from? Who are these guys? Where do they come from, right? What if all these Christians, because we've heard of people like this, right? What if these Christians all start moving into our neighborhood? and start doing the same thing. What if? We're going to lose all our money, right? That's what they're all thinking about, right? Um, they were so worried about all this what if. They didn't even pay attention to the actual woman who was healed, right? She was actually legit healed, right? But it's like, oh, no, they're all worried about all this what ifs, right? 
So they actually take Paul and Silas. There's a huge mob that formed. And they actually, this is true, the, the Bible describes, they ripped off their coats, right? Just tore off their coats, literally whipped them because they actually had them scourged. That was the, the, the language of the Bible, just actual whips, just, just scourged them and beat them to a bloody mess, right? They took them, what's left of them, they throw them into the most secure and the most darkest jail room that they have in the city, right? And Paul and Silas, they're in so much pain. They're, Paul and Silas, they're, 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 they're like excruciating, they're like torture, and they're in that tiny little dark room, right? And their feet, they're like locked up to the wall, right? They're chained to the wall, still bleeding. Open wounds, still bleeding, right? And the Bible tells us that not a single groan comes out of any, either of them. The Bible tells us not a single complaint comes out of either of them, right? Instead, what they do that night, they take the time to start encouraging each other, encouraging each other with prayer. They start praying for each other. And this is not just whispering prayer. No, they're actually reasonably loud prayer that other people can hear them, right? They're singing praises to God while in excruciating pain. And their whole reasoning is because they're found worthy to suffer shame for his sake. Well, it just means that he believes that we're worthy to actually take it. So praise God, he thinks we're strong enough. Everyone in that jail, Everyone in that jail, who's some of them who've been there for a long time, right? All they've heard, they're only used to what? Screaming, moaning, and groaning. They're here cursing and swearing and screaming. Never in the history of that jail has anybody, anybody ever heard praying and singing and praising coming out of that jail until tonight, until this night. Even all the guards, even all the guards, they're like, who are these guys, right? These guys, I mean, they don't have any coats, right? Oh, by the way, it's, it's like wintertime. They're, they're cold, they're hungry, they're bleeding, they're tortured, right? And they're praising God. Then there's this interruption, okay? So what happens is there's this huge earthquake, right? And that shakes the entire town, right? And the jail actually at the epicenter. The jail is at the epicenter of this earthquake, right? So what it shakes so hard, literally every jail door in that entire facility <laughs> busts away. All their shackles, all their chains <laughs> bust, and everybody's loose, right? It's the most craziest thing. And obviously it's uh, the work of God. Angels are there just <laughs> and just opening everything, right? The jail manager, he actually fell asleep at that time, right? Before, because uh, Paul and Silas, they're, they're singing. Apparently, as it was, it was so beautiful, right? And there's like, oh, so nice, amazing grace. And he falls asleep, but the earthquake, it shakes him and he actually wakes him up, right? And so even now, um, he wakes up. It's like, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Oh, no, right? Because it's like all the doors are open. He sees like everybody, everything's loose, right? He doesn't actually see any people at that time, right? Because, you know, the, he's waking up. It's like, oh, and he's kind of squinting. He can't see anything. It's still dark, right? And he's telling himself, what if, what if the city finds out that all these prisoners escape? They'll kill me. I'm just going to kill myself first. This is such a tragedy. This guy is married. He's got kids, but he can't. He can't deal with the thought that he's going to be put to shame, that everybody, the emperor himself is going to find out that he failed and all, all these prisoners got thrust. He took out, he takes out his sword, big sword, right? And, well, actually, it's kind of a Roman short sword, but it's a sword, right? And he's going to, what he's going to do, he's going to kill himself. They're going to kill me anyway. I'm going to just kill myself first, right? So he takes his sword, right? And all of a sudden, right before he just does it, right? Paul, from, the, from back there, he doesn't even see him, right? Here's this voice. Don't do it. We're all still here, right? 
and everybody it, it, it stops he, he, with this knife still in his hand right with the sword still in his hand everybody in that uh, what is it they actually see it's like oh my goodness right and paul offering this jail manager right this jailer just compassion we're here you don't have to kill yourself right please think about <laughs> think about your your life you, you, life is better than death everybody has never ever seen any kind of how can i say this kind of compassion this inspiration coming out of paul and silas who would show this kind of compassion this kind of mercy to this guy right this is the very guy who probably actually whipped them to, to, to the bloody mess. But nobody's as impressed as the jailer himself. He drops the, he drops the sword, right? And he pleads with Paul and Silas as he's hearing, continuing, what must I do to be saved? And this guy and his entire family, as the story tells, uh, is told, gives their entire lives to Jesus. That night, he gets baptized. That night, he brings his whole family in. They all get baptized that night. That whole night afterwards, right? Every criminal, the whole night in that jail, stays there to just listen and hear what Paul and Silas have to say about this Jesus. Nobody runs away. Nobody. They're all there. Jesus once said this in Matthew 6, 23. I'm going to close here. Your eye is like a lamp that provides light for your body. And when your eye is healthy, your whole body is filled with light. But when your eye is unhealthy, your whole body is filled with darkness. And the question would be, what do your eyes see? Do you see what ifs, what ifs, what ifs all around you? Now, I, I'm not telling you that this is easier. I, I, I'm preaching myself here. This is easier said than done. Do you see the what ifs or do you see more reasons to praise God? I'm going to put this away before we close here. Um, I thought this was a beautiful illustration. Uh, I love getting gifts for my kids, right? This year, um, I decided that uh, one of my kids, Lily, uh, she could get her own phone, right? So we talked about it and we're here. We're picking one out online, right? And she's super excited about this thing. She finally gets it, arrives in the mail, right? And her phone is actually in better condition than mine, right? It's actually a, a nicer phone than my phone, right? Anyways, so it all comes down to this, her reaction is just, you can imagine just as a dad, the amount of joy that I experience by being able to bless lily right she has this phone it's like oh my gosh and she uses it non-stop let me ask you this would i feel do you think i would feel more loved when lily plays she gets her phone and she plays what if with everything i give her including the phone that I just gave her. What if, what if, oh, what if I break it? I can't really use it because what if I break it? What if it runs out of battery? Oh, now I have to charge it all the time, right? Oh, but what if I lose the charger? You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Or would I feel more loved when Lily raises her hands with joy and she tells everybody that she has the best daddy in the whole wide world <laughs> you and me we honor god with praise that's how we honor god with our praises even the worst of circumstances the total worst right there's always more reasons there's always there's 20 more reasons to always praise this world has enough what ifers you know what I'm saying? This world has enough what ifers. They say that the difference between an amateur and a pro musician, I, I, I read this, I thought this was kind of uh, cool, is that an amateur practices until he plays it right. But a pro 
practices until he can't play it wrong. Huh, does that make sense? How about it? Let's become pros with our eyes, professional eyes, until we can't even see darkness anymore. Does that make sense? Make the what ifers look at us with awe. Say, mm, what's with these guys? How great would that make God feel? Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, this world's got plenty of what ifers. And I claim the essence of this message for myself as I preached, as those words come out of my own mouth that I should never cease to praise God with these lips, with this heart, with this mind, with my actions, with my life, that your glory should be uh, reflected beautifully, powerfully, immensely through my life, through each and every one of our lives, my sisters, my brothers, through Living Vine Fellowship, as a church, as a community. Be glorified. Be honored. Be praised. This is our desire to honor you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you, everybody.